In fact, much more than the traditional violations of individuals and communities' freedom to express and live the religion, this is already serious enough, but there is worse. And what concerns me most is the um, facility of manipulating religion, both for political purpose and for conflict purpose as well. So, so that's much more worrying when you see the uh, uh, populist politicians on one hand and when you see um, um, radical religious groups on the other hand, you feel that this is an unholy alliance between two partners. They strive on each other. So this self-generating uh, uh, tension uh, uh, escalating all the time, this is what concerns me most. I think mutual literacy. It's very important that, that diplomats and politicians know more about religion. And it's very important that religious actors know more about politics and law. It's as if uh, you're, you're bound to live together and, and, and it's a couple that ignore everything about each other. Imagine the type of life that they are. That's where we stand now. So uh, it's like ships passing in the night. And I think if I have one recipe uh, as to the tools, it's education, education, education. It's inspired by the first sentence in the article of the United Nations. We the peoples, this is one. And the second one is faith in human rights. We thought to move from faith in rights towards faith for rights. Because uh, religious values are historically the origin of human dignity, human equality, and of strife for freedom. The problem is not with religions as such. The problem is, with, uh, as I said, with the political manipulation of religions. Now, for the general public, human rights are associated with one word, freedoms, while religion is associated with an opposite word, submission. There's nothing more artificial than this, because religions, essentially, fundamentally, philosophically, are a liberating power. And human rights also is not only about rights. It contains obligations and it contains responsibilities. So this kind of myopie, uh, each side looking by one eye at half of the truth, is what's causing the problem. So we thought about the faith for rights as a way to articulate the role and responsibilities of religious actors in human rights, but using their own values. So you'll find an unprecedented um, uh, feature in this framework of faith for rights, which is composed of a declaration and 18 commitments. It refers not only to uh, human rights norms and standards in the modern international law meaning, but also to religious texts that date centuries ago, just to show that there is a convergence. I call this the double convergence, meaning what's common between all religions and beliefs, then what's common between that common and human rights norms and standards. Uh, one of the elephants in the human rights room is the definition of religion. When, when I say religion, people think of the monotonous religions only, the major religions. No, it's any belief. Atheism is a belief. Agnosticism is a belief. Uh, humanism is a belief. And they're all respected. So unless and until you bring all these beliefs together, and this is what we did, and it took us years. And when you see the document of the Faithful Rights Framework, whether it's the Declaration or the 18 Commitments itself, it's like a preamble of a convention and the dispositions of it. Of course, it's not legally binding. But Ahmed Shahid, the, special, the previous special rapporteur of freedom of religion, called it an emerging soft law. And we're glad to see this. It was adopted only five years ago, 2017, uh, while Rabat was 10 years ago, which is part and parcel. Rabat was only the, uh, the responsibility of religious uh, actors against hate speech. And then we expanded because they impact not only on hate speech. Religion in international human rights law is not only about the freedom of religion. It's also about the freedom from religion. And it's very important for people who think differently. And, and this is the contribution of human rights law to the religious sphere. In the religious sphere, you feel that as if, I'm not saying everybody is like that, but as if you are uh, a spokesperson of divinity, and then you have from top down to guide people to the truth, show them the light. No, the human rights law humbles this a little bit. I think we need more critical thinking in religion and no more humbleness in human rights in the sense of you need cultural sensitivity. And you need to admit that human rights were not born in 1948. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was not the mother of human rights. It started centuries before that. 
Yes, there were ups and downs. Yes, there were political manipulations. But the, the, the reservoir of values is still there in all faith traditions. The, the, the traditional faith values uh, were underestimating the depth and, and width of uh, wisdom in the local traditional cultures as well. And universal human rights need that. Because universality is not a stage that you reach and step there and we are there forever. It's a permanent work in progress. Actually, I'm, I'm talking about going from sporadic events to processes and from processes to a movement. And to do this, you need to go back to the basics. Frankly speaking, uh, uh, top-down have proven its limits. Top-down doesn't work. People need to be involved, meaningful participation. And that's why we talk about peer-to-peer -peer learning. And guess what? You will not be surprised when, when I tell you that this is emanating from the traditional values. In the traditional values, the way consultation is done is around the tree, is, uh, is in the open air, uh, and it's involving everybody. So going back to the origins of the grassroots in increases this horizontal exchange as opposed to the vertical imposition, whether in the name of human rights advocacy or religious breaching. In both cases, it's top down. These are rights that rely on each other immensely. You cannot have freedom of religion without the right to express your religious beliefs. And if you are a true believer in freedom of expression, you should allow people with religious conventions, uh, convictions, to express themselves, to be dressed at the way they, wa they want, to, to live the way they want, to have their holidays and respect their religious uh, symbols and holidays. Uh, the problem is that both rights are perfectly manipul manipulable. And, and, and politicians are shrewd enough to know that both inflame and both can be put at odds while they are the most two complementary rights. This teaches us that unless and until we, we, we learn how to optimize all rights that can be in tension, which is absolutely normal, at the same time, we will lose all rights. My main impression is that we increasingly have uh, uh, increased knowledge, but we did not channel them into a sustainable uh, uh, utilization yet. And by this, I mean that we need regular uh, engagement on peer-to-peer -peer mode, i.e. horizontal and among equals, uh, to address the same issues and, and reach conclusions about them. That's why in the Faith for Rights framework, we first made the declaration, which is the intellectual premises. Then we moved to the specific commitments, who owes what to who, because it's not only about interfaith dialogues. Excuse me, w what does a dialogue mean if, if the day after nothing happens? Not much. It's a series of monologues and phone of sessions at times. I'm not, I'm not generalizing, uh, but, but I'm not far from that. Uh, but the third missing element was a toolkit, i.e. a series of methodologies of peer-to-peer -peer learning that we learned partially from traditional wisdom as well, which is how to tell a story. I mean, all divine, divine bo uh, books are, are storytellers. Prophets are, are perfect storytellers. Stories make us enter the gate, uh, the, uh, the gate of beauty and the gate of art. And I think w we, are, we still need much more artistic expression in what I call art for faith, for rights.